This presentation contends that the failure to understand the cultural differences that had formed over the century of separation between colonial America and England affected the quality of intelligence gathering and ultimately the errors in intelligence analysis of the revolutionary period. Before going into the interpretive errors, we need to understand a bit about the intelligence community. Due to the limitations of time for this presentation, I'll try and keep this part as short and succinct as possible. The intelligence community is considered to be the consumers of intelligence information and those who gather and produce intelligence products. In the modern American context, this is a very large network of government, military, and civilian agencies. In the revolutionary period, this would have been the Congress, senior military officers, and those in the field gathering information along with those moving it from point to point. Intelligence is information that may be useful for political or military decision making. It is gathered either in the clear, openly available, or covertly. Newspaper articles in uh, the colonies in England provided politically useful information in the clear for both sides during this period. Information gathering from behind closed doors in meetings or in private conversations of both a political or military interest passed to the opposing side under some level of secrecy would have been considered covert. Both the Americans and the English had full access to an abundance of in the clear intelligence. However, neither seemed to be particularly adept at utilizing it. Both sides also had numerous pathways for covert information. Information gathering can be broken down into two very basic types for our purposes, human intelligence and signals intelligence. Human intelligence is the information a person gathers through physical observation of a place, an event, or by listening to the originating parties in a conversation and then passing that information along. Signals intelligence in a modern context includes a variety of analog and digital communications disciplines, encryption and encoding and decoding. In the revolutionary context, it would be any message in transit including any encoding or decoding necessary. This would also include any code breaking necessary to understand the message. Once information is gathered, it needs to move from the initiating point to its destination. This may include many intermediary points and may cross lines of conflict many times. George Washington is well known as the spy master of the Revolutionary War along with the leader of the culperspiring Colonel Benjamin Talmadge. Washington was well informed and adept at using a wide range of encoding and decoding schemes, mostly ciphers. Ciphers are letter or word replacement schemes, such as the commonly used book cipher. The book cipher uses a book known to both the sender and receiver as a key. One variant uses a numeric pattern groups of four numbers each number in a group representing the page, paragraph, line, and word. This word would be the encoded text. It is time consuming to use, but it's extremely secure, even today, as long as the key is kept secret. These four words are from one of our textbooks in the course. Um, they could be enough for Colonel Talmadge to warn General Washington that an attack was imminent with the date, who's attacking, and where they are attacking. The key to that will come up at the end of the video. Interception would be pointless unless the courier had a knowledge of what the book was for the key, which the courier most likely wouldn't know. From here, either the message would arrive or not arrive if it were intercepted. It wouldn't make any sense to try and fake the message without knowing what the key was. If the message was sent by two couriers on different paths, there was a good chance the message would get through. Benedict Arnold also used book ciphers on occasion to communicate with General Washington as well as with the British. 
with the message either sent by courier or intercepted and transported to its destination, it's time to analyze the intelligence to determine its value diplomatically or militarily. All parties had these capabilities. None were holding any greater advantage over the others, except maybe the individuals practicing the statecraft or spycraft. With all of this intelligence, all parties having access to it, why is there such a failing in intelligence? What it comes down to is human nature. Over the course of several generations, by separation of the Americans and the British, they no longer held the same core priorities in life. Americans, by and large, placed their liberty above the crown. Even the loyalists, who would rather have stayed subjects of the crown, could only do so if they felt that they had the same rights and representations as other Englishmen back home. Liberty was a priority. Because of these differences, they viewed their opponents through their own lens, a lens that filtered out very important information in the materials readily available to them. They felt they had a common thread, but they were much further apart than they realized. England saw her colonial children being petulant, picking at her heels while she was trying to deal with more important matters at home. The truth of American sentiment and aggravations were clear as newsprint. If only His Majesty's government had taken the time to read the colonial papers and pamphlets with an open eye, they would have known. Had they taken the time to see what was being said about the Gatsby affair, as one instance, in the southern colonies, as well as in New England, England might not have considered winning over the southern colonies as such an easy task. The same affliction fell on the Americans. Teenagers demanding to be seen as adults, perceiving everything the mother country does as an attack on their liberty, ignoring all of the financial and political strife back in England, a flagging economy, commodity shortages, political strife between parties, not to mention the still fresh memories of an overthrown monarchy. All readily available information ready for viewing in newsprint. Both sides stuck in their own perspectives, circling the political drain together on opposite sides. It was inevitable that the conflict would reach the level of full aggression. It wasn't the lack of intelligence gathering, so much as the failure to use the readily available intelligence to temper decision making and to look beyond the limited lens of their own perspectives. One of the purposes for doing history is to learn from the past, what mistakes have been made, and how to apply that understanding to the future, so we can prevent the same mistakes from repeating. Unfortunately, humankind in our societies around the globe seem to be remarkably bad at this. As an example, we can look at Afghanistan. The Soviet Union occupied Afghanistan in 1979, eventually leaving in 1989 with their tail between their legs. Twelve years later, in 2001, the U.S. engaged Afghanistan and remained for 20 years. I don't want to get mired in the politics of Afghanistan. The point is, the Soviets had a very long and painful slog in that country, costing a lot of blood and treasure enough that it ultimately contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union. We also had a very long and painful slug in that country, also costing far too much blood and treasure. Outside factors put aside, both conflicts dealt with a dug-in, passionate resistance of a native people. Both times the invading forces felt they had a better grasp of the cultural differences than previous invaders, and both times they were woefully wrong about their level of understanding of the native culture. Should we or could we have learned more from the Soviet engagement in Afghanistan? Conflicts continue to arise, and most likely they will always continue to arise. Also often, 
there seems to be a number of elements that seem familiar in these conflicts patterns that continually repeat themselves how often in modern history have misconceptions of intelligence led to conflicts that could have been otherwise negotiated or avoided altogether how often has a lack of understanding of cultural differences between two groups or more been the cause of failures in interpreting intelligence for americans the failures of intelligence analysis leading up to and during the Revolutionary War played out to American advantage. But how often since have failures in intelligence analysis led to no more than the loss of American blood and treasure? Thank you for your time.